Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here for Literacy Lunch. Um, I'm really excited today because I did a uh, uh, webinar over the weekend about reading comprehension and it was really really good um, and it's like the first one of four so you can expect more of these coming um, and so what I'm gonna do today is basically like straight out of that webinar okay so it's not copying it's like just what's the there's a word for it inspired um, yeah okay so here at uh, ISG, you know, we're a, we're a workshop model school, but that doesn't really mean that we have to follow the units of study or, you know, we have to follow any prescriptive kind of curriculum. It just means that we use assessment to drive our instruction, right? And we use small group and one-on-one -on -one conferences to grow learners, in readers, it's to grow, uh, in readers workshop, it's to grow readers, to build reading identity. And, um, you know, one of the best ways to do that is through conferencing. So that's kind of the basis of where we're going with this. But today it's going to be all about, hey, Vidya. Uh, it'll Hello, be all... everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> yeah. uh, We'll be talking more about like comprehension. And then next week, it'll be more about like individual conferences. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. So the goal of reading conferences and small group, small group work is to take your teaching from a conference, right? Where it's applied to one singular book and then kind of inform the student that although they're learning this one skill, it really can be transferred to all your general reading. So that's the, the goal here is to go from specific to general so students can apply what they learn to all books. Or, you know, this transfers really easily to just learning in general where if you're talking about a, any type of learning skill or trait, how you might be practicing it in one instance, but then you transfer it to general stuff okay so here's a quote you can read um we're talking about comprehension today and i think a lot of comprehension work and like the idea about comprehension is a student reads something and then you ask them a question to see if they comprehend it but that's really not how they learn how to comprehend, right? Um, there's a quote, and I forget who said it, but comprehension floats on a sea of talk, right? So students really understand things and, com and build those strategies by talking. So sometimes that's teacher to student, and then sometimes, and it's most impactful when it's student to student. Okay. so. Let's just practice this here. Here's a comprehension question, and I'm just assuming everyone's familiar with Harry Potter. So this is a comprehension question, right? What words would you use to describe Harry Potter, support your idea with text evidence? Jas, go for it. <laughs> How did I know you'd come to me first? <laughs> um... Sorry, you don't have to. Anyone, I mean, this is just for funsies, right? Okay, well, I would say um, adventurous um, mm -hmm. because they are in each book, there's like at least one big adventure, and those adventures get bigger and bigger and bigger with each book. No spoilers, but. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else? He's. Oh, oh go for it, Lydia. Yeah, and I felt that, uh, you know, sometimes he's very naive, especially when it uh, comes to his uh, role, the way he looks at his teacher, um, who is actually, I mean, I feel that um, he's innocent in a way. He's, uh, he's naive, 
though he has his magical powers and then um, yeah he's uh, uh, the way he looks at his teacher mr scape uh, that's quite different like at first he had a different opinion about him and then when he actually gets to know about his background then he changes his opinion so uh, that's something away from being adventure which usually children uh, has a, a common thinking about that yes harry potter is all about magical powers and adventure and so on this is something what i feel is different about him at most situations he is he is a reflection of what he is internally and not a disguise right Mm, yeah, good insight there. Jas, did you want to add on to something or what you said before? Yeah, because I was talking about the books and then I realized I read the question properly and I realized you're talking about Harry Potter just as a person. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, if I think about one book in particular, he's very angry and isolated because he's being shut out from a lot of things that are going on, the situations. Other people know more information than he does, and it leads him to feeling very angry towards people that he trusts. Is that better? Uh, I, I'm not a judge here. I'm just a curious person. Um, okay, that was great. You all, I'm so proud of you. You did a really nice job. But you may have noticed that really wasn't a conversation, right? Everyone was just answering their questions individually. So in order to develop more of a conversation, the, the suggestion from the workshop I did was to start with an idea statement, right? To start with an opinion. So this is what that might look like. If Harry Potter is such a great wizard, he should have stood up to the Dursleys and not let them push him around for so long. So you might agree with that, disagree, or somewhere in the middle, up, down, up, down, or both. What do you think? Show me your thumbs. Yeah, Jenny, you have two thumbs down. That's a strong opinion. Can you like explain what you're thinking? Yes, because I feel like when he was, a lot of this trauma that happened to him happened before he got his magical powers and before he became who he was. And and I think when we face bullies like that from our childhood, they have an extra strong hold on us. And so maybe like he was getting his magical powers, but maybe he wasn't mentally ready. And he did start to stand up um, later on in the series. No spoilers. Yeah, so I, I strongly disagree with that. Mm. Thanks. Uh, Jess, do you have your hand up or was that from before? <laughs> no. Any Heather, did you unmute? Oh, I was just gonna say, I'd like to hear from Graham because he was the only one who agreed. Oh, I didn't notice that. Graham, please tell us, tell us more. Okay, um, initially I put my thumb up because you said show me your thumbs and my default is up. Uh, and then I thought I would stick with up. Um, yeah, I'd, having not read all of the books, maybe I don't have the same insight as Jenny does, but it seems very simple to me if he's getting pushed around and he has the ability um, to do something about it advocate for himself and for his friends, then I wonder why he didn't without knowing. I'm As an outsider, it feels like, it feels obvious that he could have used those powers to, to support himself and his friends. Yeah, I don't know enough. And wonder if he could have done that in maybe a compassionate way. Um, I don't know. That's, me, that's my initial thoughts on that statement. Yeah, Jenny? Well, they were his family. They, he so desperately craved acceptance from his family. And so often people who you desperately crave acceptance from as if you are an orphan or, you know, you're so I think it's a different dynamic there because maybe he didn't want to stand up because maybe he was afraid if he did, then he wouldn't get this long sought after acceptance or I don't, I don't, that's, that's, I'm lowering my hand. Graham? Sorry, I don't think I knew Dursley's were. That's maybe something that I should have known. 
they might have been, the, yeah, okay, I thought those were guys at school. <laughs> Great. So when you use this strategy, anyone can participate, even people who, you know, haven't read the, the story. <laughs> it's not a good example. But you might have noticed that there's more of a conversation, right? Graham was talking back to Jenny. He mentioned her name. Um, I'm sure the rest of you are maybe just feeling shy. But when you start with an idea statement that kind of evokes an emotion, one, the thumbs up, thumbs down, agree, disagree, lets everyone's voices be heard right off the bat, right? And then you can ask who wants to participate. So it's a way to increase engagement and then also um, have more of a discussion and not just everyone individually answering their question, the question from their viewpoint. So that's kind of the idea, right? You want to teach students how to make their own idea statements but while you're doing that, you model it a lot, right? So we're going to try this. Um, I'm going to read you something. And then you'll just like write down a sentence or two of what you're thinking. Or just think it. You don't have to write it down. Type it. Um, and then we'll see how this goes, okay? I'm probably not doing it right, but I only have 30 minutes, so... This is from a story called You Disappearing. So you can just close your eyes and listen. It's hard to read and listen at the same time, so whatever you want. Hmm. When I went downstairs this morning and found Cookie missing, I knew that official emergency procedure called for me to phone all the information into the Bureau of Disappearances. At the prompting of the pre-recorded voice, I would enter my social security number and zip code. I would press two to report the sudden absence of an animal, three for domestic animal, and then at the sound of the tone, I would speak the word cat clearly and audibly into the telephone receiver. The woman's voice would then give a short parametric definition of a cat, and if this definition matched my missing item, I could press the pound sign to record a 15 second description. A three-note melody would let me know that my claim had been filed, and then that lovely pre-recorded voice would read out my assigned case number, along with some instructions on how to update or cancel my claim. Instead, I picked up the phone and pushed your number into it. I was always telling you about problems you couldn't fix, as though multiplying badness could dilute it. Cookie's gone, I said and waited for your response. There was a pause at, on the other end of the line. Have you phoned it in, you asked? Your voice was casual, like it was someone else's pet entirely, a pet from a faraway land owned by people we'd never meet. I didn't, I said. I'm kind of depressed, I added. I was often depressed, but now we all had better reasons to be. I'm sorry, you said back. Cookie loved to chew on wires, I said. I know, you said. You didn't say you wished you could be here. I didn't say it either. There was nothing more to say. I hung up the phone. Sometimes I dialed you right back. I dialed you back right away just to hear you pick up and know that your hands were at that very moment resting on a chunk of plastic that threaded its way delicately to me over hundreds of miles of wire and cord, to know that even though your voice had disappeared, you had not yet. But recently, I hadn't been allowing myself any callbacks. I was getting more afraid of the day when you wouldn't pick up. Okay, so just take like two minutes and write down what you're thinking, any thoughts, maybe an idea statement or opinion.
about 30 seconds. Okay, I realized I forgot to mention that like we're practicing this as adults. So <laughs> that wasn't like a kid's story. I don't know if that was surprising to anyone. But um, yeah, does anyone have something they wanna share? An idea, a thought? Yeah, Heather. So am I supposed to read what I wrote? Is that what you want me to do? Whatever you wanna share. Uh, so mine's kind of long and a little bit of, okay, so I just said this relationship is one-sided and the people involved feel very differently about one another now than they used to. The person who is doing the calling was the person who did the hurting, which is kind of an assumption, but that was my assumption. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jess? Um, I put down for my idea statement, um, kind of along the same lines as Heather, the narrator, they're obsessed with the person they're calling you in the book. Um, and I, I felt the same way. There's, there's definitely a disconnected relationship. Um, and maybe Cookie was the only thing that the narrator had left that they shared with this person. And now Cookie had gone. What did they have left? Hence the callbacks, the constant callbacks. So they could, like, the only connection they had now was knowing that that person was on the other end of the line. Thanks, Jess. Jenny? I was just struck with how beautifully it was written. Um, I just, the, the way that it was crafted, it was just very um, expert level. And I would like to know the name of the book, please. Yeah, I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. This one is called You Disappearing, but it's a part of a short story, a novel of short stories by Alexandra. Kleeman. Anyone else want to share? So this is not from Harry Potter, right? This is chapter one of the first book of Harry Potter. As I wrote down, he should have just magicked up another cat. <laughs> Such a jerk, Graham. <laughs> no, I didn't. I my real thing was that the person who was doing the calling was lonely with or without the cat and i i sense some regret or remorse within her um feelings i i i, I connected a lot to what um, the others have said already thanks <laughs> it's too much for graham Valerie or Vidya, do you want to share? You don't have to if you don't want to. It's fine. I was really focused on, yes, like I understood that that relationship, like like what Je uh, Jess said, it was disconnected. Like it wasn't on both sides. But I also like also related to the character who lost their pet and like what a devastating time that it is because – Pets become such a part of our lives, and then that empty space is such a lonely time. And, like, with the loss of an animal or, like, a family member, like, you lean on those closest to you. It's a very dark time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Lydia? Exactly. I felt that uh, it was a very hard time uh, for the character because um, – his, his intuitions of losing someone is overriding his uh, comfort level. And then he feels like um, at one point of a time, he's actually losing or moving away from the person he, he loves or uh, he enjoys spending time with. You know, that silence when he says that I really don't want to have a time where I can really feel that despite being present there, but I still can't hear you. So that's what uh, I really felt that his intuitions of losing someone, his fear of losing someone 
is actually uh, you know putting them away taking the relationship further far away thanks does anyone else want to add on to anything they said or to something someone else said yeah heather uh, I just, from hearing everybody, and I, I, you know, it seems we've all kind of had a similar take of it. I just, like, I feel like there's just this dependency, like this one-way dependency that's happening. Um, and it, like, they don't know what to do, it feels, you know, like, so they just call back, right? So it's like they do something, but it's not necessarily healthy or the right thing, which is like the cat, right? They lost the cat. The right thing to do would have been to call to find the cat with this what was it? The lost uh, company, whatever, with the dial tone and the whatever. Um, but that was, you know, there's such a dependency that they couldn't even like do the right thing because they had to do the thing that like their heart needed, you know, um, because of the dependency. Yeah. So interesting. So I'm going to try my best here. Uh, I'm really new at this, but in a class, what you would do is notice what the students are doing, what kind of a reader they are, and kind of call that out. So what kind of strategies they're using. So I was taking notes as you were all sharing. Whew, okay, forgive me if I mess this up. But what I was hearing is that Heather and Jas, you're both kind of emotional readers. So your first instinct was to go to the emotion that the narrator was feeling. Heather, at the end, you added on a little bit of judgment of that character, right? You were saying this is what she should have done, or he, I don't think gender's ever said, but you were like, they, they have so much dependency that they weren't able to actually do the right thing, what they should have done. Um, Jenny, your reading of this text seemed more to go to the craft, the author's how they were writing so how the author crafted this you called it an expert and you just kind of were like i want to read the rest of the story you weren't really digging into the emotion of it you're just like i want to find out what happens um appreciating how the author was writing um valerie you got stuck up in the beginning half of it it seems like like you were really uh you, you noticed this detail about the lost pet and it's maybe because you have cats yourself <laughs> that you kind of got wrapped up in this feeling and that was uh what you brought to the group um so it seems like you you kind of zoom in on where you connect with the text and you you make these personal connections to help you comprehend and understand um let's see vidya you're actually, I think, the only, well, Heather did it at the end, but you were the only one who referred directly to the text. You said in the part where he said, or she said uh, about feeling so lonely, you know, you were taking bits that came straight from um, the text. Graham, you said Colin was feeling lonely with regret or remorse. I don't really know what kind of reader. You, you threw me off because you were being silly in the beginning. <laughs> so. If this Sorry. was with the class, so sorry, if this is with the class, you're naming strategies, you're saying you're the kind of reader who, and kind of pulling out those, noticing and naming, right? That's what it's called, noticing and naming, giving a name to what these moves that they're doing organically. So what this could look like in the classroom is uh you know you can gen make the generalized statement and then put in like exactly what the students have said right we think about the characters actions we think about what happened earlier in the story like valerie we think about who the characters act like um you could talk about reading personalities Right. And you could group those up and, you know, students might change or depending on the book, they have a different reading personality. But it's kind of bringing an authenticity to reading so that they can take it from one book and generalize it. Um, what Sophie's class does to understand their reading. So, again, these are just a list of strategies. Right. And once you have them up and posted, students can pull from that. 
Plus, it happens in a group, like what we just did. You might have heard me say, Val, you really made a connection to that cat situation. And you might think, ooh, I'm going to see if I can make connections to the next book I read. Um, and this is a just kind of a bulletin board where it's added on, right? Okay. So I think this obviously is where we have to end it. I have the rest of the story. None of you even have any idea what's going to happen next. It's a crazy story. Um, but maybe I'll save that for next week because uh, it'll be all about how we revise our theories because we talk about revising a lot in writing, but revising happens constantly, whether we're learning or uh, reading or learning in general, right? Your theories about a character after the first chapter of a book or after the first two pages, if you're in KG1, <laughs> should be very different than the theory you have about them at the end of the book. You should be revising your thinking. Um, anyway, I guess that's where it will end it. It doesn't feel like a nice place to wrap it up, but um, we're out of time. So <laughs> I, hope, I hope that was okay. Thanks for playing along with me. And um, we'll talk more next week if you're free. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That was so cool. Thank you very much. I hope it was okay. Yeah, I. Uh, that was cool. Can I say though, yeah. when you said that about like, oh, like I'll look at Val and I'll do that next time. I was like, yeah, I did that with Jenny when she talked about the craft. I didn't even think about that. Like, it didn't oh. even cross my mind as, like, something to think about. Yeah, and isn't it so funny? And also, this whole strategy, what we're doing, right, is I was learning about it in the form of reading comprehension. But as I was learning about it, I was like, this works for math. This works for science. This will work for anything, right? It's not just reading comprehension floats on a sea of talk. Learning floats on a sea of talk, right? If you, yeah. I don't know, it was just really interesting. And I, that was, I was going to talk about that more, but next week we'll kind of yeah. bring yeah. it up. No, it was really good, Caitlin. Thanks. Yeah. Well, Thanks. Thank I didn't so think up. This is like exactly what I did in my PD. I'm just copying it. <laughs> well, well, your delivery it. was top notch. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Okay, ladies, <laughs> thank you for coming, and I'll see you next week, okay? Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.